and welcome. We're having an exciting show tonight. I'm excited about my guests, about the topic, about a book they've written, and we're going to be talking about the brain. I was thinking as I was driving here, back in junior high, we learned all about the heart, the atrium, the ventricles. We learned about our teeth, bicuspids and molars, but we didn't learn much about the brain. And now we're catching up as a society and our medical and scientific leaders are, are pushing the frontier. So it's exciting to learn about it and um, to have you folks writing about it. My guests are uh, first David Alter, who is a psychologist in private practice right. here in Minneapolis. And you're with Partners in Healing of Minneapolis, right? which is a, a group you co-founded, I believe, in 2000. That's right. I co-founded that. It's a center for integrative uh, health, integrative medicine, and we work with people across the lifespan. It's been a nice journey for us. Doing testing and counseling. Any and number of things. Speaking. Therapies, testing, speaking, uh, the range, the gamut of things that uh, are the services that people are seeking. And you have some some colleagues that work with you, two or three or four? Right, we're a group now of, of about uh, eight or nine oh, eight clinicians or nine. representing okay. medicine and uh, psychology and social work and uh, marriage and family therapy. So a lot of the mental health and uh, developmental specialties and subspecialties across the lifespan. And that's an important part of it. Um, our second guest is Henry Emmons. Henry was on a few years ago talking about a very popular book that you've heard about, I bet, called The Chemistry of Joy. And since then, you've written a book that I didn't get to talk with you yet about called The Chemistry of Calm, and a workbook about the book about joy. And you are a psychiatrist um, working in a couple different places. Uh, more than a couple. To, <laughs> but more? Yes, I, I you have a varied list uh, work them? life. Uh, well, I, for years I've done college mental health. Um, I now work with a, um, a private practice group, and we we do individual patient care, but also a lot of different group work and teaching. That's called Partners in Resilience. Mm -hmm. uh, David and I are, are launching our program and, and our work uh, with this book coming out now tomorrow. And, and so um, I enjoy doing a lot of different things, a lot of speaking and teaching. And right. It's been a, a really nice part of my career. And I've read somewhere that when you were um, training to be a psychiatrist, you realized that you wanted to look more at the whole person than right. some of your colleagues. Right, I'd always been interested in that, even before medical school, and, um, and then through my training and my early years of practice, it, I found it, it hard to, to, to keep that going because there wasn't a lot, yeah. a lot happening in the, the fields of psychiatry, even medicine. There is a lot more happening now, uh, fields called integrative medicine or integrative mm -hmm. mental health. Uh, where, where people are doing the kind of work that David and I do, um, of pulling together uh, really the best of both worlds, or more than two worlds, uh, where we're, we're still using Western medicine and science, but we're also you know, really uh, trying to learn from other, uh, other health care practices. Um, traditions. Traditions. Uh, a lot of the work we're talking about now involves the wisdom traditions, which have so much to offer when we talk about aging and caring for our brains and and so it's that blending and trying to weave things together into a, a coherent model that makes sense to people and that people can access. I read somewhere, and it's been quite a few years uh, since I've read this, but that one third of all people um, do seek out alternative or complementary uh, help in the health world. And I thought that's a real sign that perhaps the public was a little ahead of a lot of the medical schools in terms of wanting I to I think blend. that's really true. I, I think that the strength of Western medicine over the last 50 or more years has been its ability to take things apart and understand what some of the working parts are at that lower level. The problem is none of us exist at that level. We're whole human beings where every part is connected to every other part. And I think the public recognized 
when they were being treated as a collection of pieces and parts that in a sense they weren't being attended to. And I think they've helped push the curve back and the work Henry and I do is part of that, trying to bring that holistic integrative perspective that really honors the integrity or holism of the person, not just their pieces mm -hmm. and parts. I think most people like that approach. Well, when I read the book the last week here, um, I got into each chapter and saw lots of old information, but presented in a way that sort of refreshed my take on it. Good. And um, then I thought as I was driving here, but how do you describe the whole of the book? Right at this moment, I'm excited about all the pieces, mm -hmm. but how do you say to people what the book's whole focus is? Okay. Uh, that's a that's a really good question, and and it is a it is a challenge. I will say to to try to um, really to talk about all of the things that make us up as human beings. You know, we don't we don't believe that you, you just need to focus on one thing or one remedy or treatment, and and so it's it's a mo little more challenging. But that's really our preference. Um, the book really is about how to care for your brain as you age. But of course, the brain is embedded in a body <laughs> and a mind, which is a little different than the brain. We can talk more about that. Um, and then also, there is a heart. And we're talking about not just the pumping heart, but the, the part of us that, that connects us to other people and to a life of meaning and purpose and mm -hmm. authenticity. So we really wanted to talk about all of those things and to do it with the background of really good, solid neuroscience. The, the, the good new findings in brain science have a lot to offer, especially when you, when you bring in some of the old, um, really age-old wisdom from other traditions that, that help us address all of these things, you know, the body, the mind, the heart, in a really comprehensive way. I you can just add, add something to that. When you ask about what the, the purpose of the book as a whole is, what is that overarching message, mm -hmm. especially when we're dealing with the topic of aging, there's so many myths that people succumb to mm -hmm. that fears basically too, they're right? fears. They really mm -hmm. are fear-driven myths. That's mm -hmm. a great way to say it. And much of the book, using the neuroscience findings that Henry talked about and the wisdom tradition information that we've known literally for thousands of years, debunks some of those myths and hopefully begins to calm some of those fears. The message being, change is possible. Change is always possible. So even if you haven't done things up until this point in your life, start now, it's not too late. And if you have quite a bit of your life ahead of you, why wait until later? Start now. Um, let's hold the book up, because I don't even think I've given the title to you folks. Stain Sharp is the, the big title. And do you want to read off the subtitle? Because Sure. It's, it's Nine Keys for a Youthful Brain Through Modern Science and Ageless Wisdom. A nice tagline there. Um, but reading upside down, hard to read. <laughs> um, and as you said, I think it's good for people, not just who are aging, but anyone who's under stress, I think, would find this book very helpful. I want to go back to something early in the book that I read that I was intrigued with. It says, you say, that the brain uh, weighs only two pounds, or is 2% two, two of our, our body weight, but uses 30 to 40% of our energy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have you explain that. Um, that's a big statement. It is, when you think about the fuel that the body uses, it doesn't matter really whether it is a muscle in your calf or it's the brain itself. It all uses the same fuel, and that's glucose. Everything that we eat is ultimately broken down and is used as glucose. So that percent that you refer to shows how central, how integral the brain is in regulating, coordinating, guiding, deciding everything that goes on 
whether we're awake or asleep. So it's a huge consumer of that energy, which is why it's so important to take a look at what is the raw fuel that you put in. And we talk a lot about nutrition. And many of the keys that we talk about are really ways of making sure that the form that the fuel takes and the kind of fuel that the brain is given is the right kind of fuel so that this thing called the brain and its relationship to the body that it's a part of is running well whether you're 20 or 120. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to ask you about the fuel, the, the diet nutrition section. I want to ask you about sleep and I'd like to, mm -hmm. I think, ask you first about sleep because when you said the brain is working it's working really hard while we sleep. And right. I didn't know that, that was Well, I think that 30% that 30, 30 of energy being used by the brain is an indication that it, it's never really offline. The brain never really shuts down. It's, right. it's working even as we sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, sleep is perhaps the, the one really non-negotiable aspect of self-care. You know, we can cheat from, for, from time to time with our diets, and we don't have to exercise every single day, mm -hmm. but if you have even one night's sleep, the next day your brain is not working right. It is so crucial for mental health. It's so crucial for uh, focus and memory. And I think it's also really crucial for prevention of some of the problems that mm -hmm. can come with age, you know, including you know, some of the really um, feared dementias like Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's a lot that we can do if we start early that, that can have an influence on, um, on how we do in our later years. Right. I think you use the word magic of sleep, and really it's magic and it's also essential sounding. Um, the CDC said, and you quote in the book, there's an epidemic, a public health epidemic in our country because of lack of sleep. Right. Um, let's share, or I'd love to have you share, some of the ideas that you have that help people get more sleep, more good quality sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so they are giving their brain mm -hmm. uh, support that way. What are some that? of your yeah. favorite tips? Okay. Might be might be helpful to, to say that there are, there are two really essential things that the brain is doing while we sleep, and it is uh, it, it's so important that they be done, because if not, our bodies just simply don't work right. And and so one of them has to do with keeping our circadian rhythm in proper alignment. This has so much to do with light and dark, and so we'll come back to that. Uh, but the whole body, not just the brain, not just the pineal gland, which is sort of the master timekeeper, but the, the entire body is regulated by this 24-hour rhythm that really comes from light and dark, sunrise and sunset. And that is a really crucial aspect of sleeping in a, in a regular way. The second thing that's, that is happening, this is relatively new science that uh, really just came out a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. that we now know that the brain, just like the rest of the body, has to clean itself out, has to clean out the waste products, the toxins, the, the proteins that build up, and that happens best at night. And is that the glymphatic system the that you The glymphatic about? system, which right. you know, it's a new, relatively new term. We've all heard yeah. the lymph or lymphatic right. system, which is the rest of the body. But there are channels in the brain that open up at night when the rest of the activity of the brain kind of quiets down. And it's just absolutely crucial for preventing buildup of proteins and other things that we think are related to different forms of dementia. So these toxic chemicals then are kind of shunted away from the brain? They're shunted away, mm -hmm. they're taken, you know, then they the eventually system. end up in the bloodstream and so the body can get rid of them. But it's the, the analogy that these um, scientists used who discovered this is that it's, it's like an office building, mm -hmm. which is I think a really nice analogy. So just imagine a really busy office building, everybody <laughs> is working hard during the day. There's no 
there's no space for a cleaning crew to come in. Mm -hmm. So when everybody else goes home at night, the cleaning crew comes in, they've got room to move around, then they can clean it out. That's very much like what happens in the brain. And so, so if we're not getting deep sleep, the crew doesn't come in? The crew doesn't That's have right. a chance to come in. Those, mm -hmm. those, uh, those little tiny channels don't have a chance to open up and, and let this mm -hmm. waste product drain out, essentially. And if we're not getting the sleep, another related issue is that part of sleep that is so essential for long-term health is that it's a time when we process the experience of the day. It's the review time. And we need to be in a stage of sleep and a state of sleep that allows the brain to filter experience, extracting from it anything that is useful and important and being able to discharge the rest. So are we doing that, David, via dreaming? Dreaming, or, that's or right. Something that's separate. one of the functions of dreams, is to do that kind of filtering. So if you're disrupting sleep, especially these folks that have middle insomnia, they may fall asleep in the beginning of the night, but they can't stay asleep and have a lot of trouble falling back asleep. What they're hitting most is the second half of the night's sleep when most of the dreaming time is occurring. So they're really shorting themselves on that ability to filter. So the next morning, in a sense, you haven't yet figured out what you're going to take forward from the previous day. It's all weighing on your shoulders, and now you have another day to face. And you can just picture how you, little by little you begin to fall behind. That's a huge stressor on a long-term basis that's not very healthy. So I'm just getting the signal. We've got 10 minutes left. Okay. Oh so I want to, <laughs> want to get just a couple of your hot tips okay. for getting a good night's sleep, and then let's talk about some let of me, the Let me say three, three things that people can do that are really helpful for sleep. First is to keep your, your rhythm as regular as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And that, so getting up at about the same time every day, even if you didn't get to bed at the usual time, if you stayed up late, just especially that wake up time, not letting yourself sleep in very much, just a little bit. Second thing is to use light more effectively. Our bodies uh, do best when we have bright light exposure in the morning and or, or midday, preferably from the sun, but if you can't do that, use a very bright light, um, such as you can purchase easily, you know, with a, a, people use them for seasonal affective disorder. The same lights are really helpful at regulating your sleep if you use it early in the day. The second thing about light is to have really minimal, extreme care with how bright your lights are at night, especially the last hour or two. It, it's amazing um, what the research says about that, about how even just a, a typical bedside lamp or a reading lamp is too much uh, for the sake of your sleep. It will set back your, your melatonin production by you know, an hour or more. So be really, really careful about that. And then um, the, the third thing is to, to pay more attention to what you're doing earlier in the day, especially in the evening. Not eating too much, very Not late. Exercising. The exercising kind of early in the day, being really careful about alcohol very close to bedtime, um, cutting the caffeine out way early if you're having trouble sleeping. Well, we are talking now about diet because I wanted to shift gears and ask you some of your big tips about what diet means in terms of brain health and staying sharp. Um, interesting things going on right now. We're learning maybe fat isn't all as bad as we thought it was. Right. And uh, what are the key things that you think we should take away in the short time we have here that people should pay attention to? Sure. So one really simple way to think about diet with brain, the brain is that whatever is good for the heart or the rest mm. of the body is also good for the brain. Mm. It's good for the goose, the it's good for the gander. That's right. That's right. But mm -hmm. diet actually has a really, really big part to play in how our brains age and how um, nimble and, and flexible they stay, which we'll talk about in a moment. But um, there really are, th are three important, important things that you can address through diet uh, that help protect your brain. One is 
uh, your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. The second is stress and the effects of stress. And then the third is inflammation. And they're all interrelated. So blood sugar has a lot more to do with brain function and structure than anyone would imagine. It takes very little change in the blood sugar you know, that, that, that someone has over time. If that changes or, or creeps up just a little bit, it's really hard on the brain. It does not like that. Um, and one of the, the really kind of interesting findings is that the brain literally shrinks if people have elevated blood sugars. And when you talk about elevated, blood sugar, you are talking about over 100, right? Yes, if it stays that way. You know, after a meal or, or something, it may shoot up. But if you have it stay up at that level, because usually which is related to diet, it's really hard on how your brain works. And one of the, the problems with that is that it does cause inflammation. And when the brain gets inflamed, it causes all kinds of problems, including depression or mood problems, yeah. sleep disturbance. Um, trouble focusing or concentrating or with memory. And then the third thing is stress, which is um, both you know, what we all think of as stress, but also the stress that comes from metabolizing and uh, dealing with all the things that build up in your body. And so diet is just really protective for that. So all of this has to do with keeping the brain not only working well, but also growing and creating new pathways. And so we, we talk a lot in our book about neuroplasticity and how to, how to think about the, um, you know, moving your brain in the direction of greater health and, and, and especially your mind. And maybe you can talk a little about that. Well, you've been talking about diet. So we're talking about physical food that you put into the body. Right. The body has a hunger for that food, but the mind has a hunger for experience. And there, are, right? there are three mm -hmm. linked mental uh, habits, curiosity, flexibility, and then optimism. And they really are linked with each other. And I think the important thing to keep in mind is that they represent skills. They are habits. Curiosity is the habit that engages you in the world with things that you haven't yet experienced. It's that hunger to experience something new and different when you exercise that, you're producing new pathways in the brain. So are you saying, David, that if a person hasn't been a real curious person, they can they become, still could curious. become more curious. And, and you that's can do a that good in thing for your that's your right. overall health, your brain health, right? Because anytime you are exposed to and to things that are just what you've experienced before, there's no novelty. You become stuck. You get stuck in a rut, right? Mm -hmm. So curiosity is something that helps you get out of that. Flexibility is what you learn to do when you encounter something new. It sort of tickles the brain. It stimulates the brain. When you are forced to say, I haven't encountered this before. I'm not quite sure what to do. Flexibility is what you learn to do in response to that. Now, when you've been curious and flexible, the attitude and the habit that develops is optimism that essentially says whatever life throws at me I will be able to deal with I'll be able to show resilience and in the process you're building new pathways through uh, through neuroplasticity so some they're really people, healthy for the brain some people might say oh optimism that can that can be akin to Pollyanna, Pollyanna kind of That's thinking right. But you're not talking about no. that, are you? I think that the optimism that we talk about is actually what I would call a fearless realism. Hmm, I like so that. So optimism is not pretending that things aren't the way they are. That's the Pollyanna world. Mm -hmm. This kind of optimism is saying, I see how they are. And in spite of that, mm -hmm. I believe that if I stay with this, I'll be able to overcome it and I'll be able to land on my feet. That's the essence of resiliency, which is so much a part of long-term brain so health. So it's looking realistically, right. but then having hope and- Hope, trust, asking faith. Asking for support probably. That's um, right, et cetera. exactly, that's right. Um, fearless optimism. Fearless like realism. Fearless realism, right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I like that, that's okay. great. Um, we're getting a signal that we should uh, let people know how they can learn more about Great. the book, about your work. Um, 
about each of your centers, go to www.stainsharp.org. Stain Sharp, the name of the book. So I understand your website is uh, birthing, you know, uh, tomorrow, very, very soon. Along so, with the book launch. Yeah, so we're uh, hot off the press here in that sense. Well, I wish we had more time. There are so many ideas um, that I'd love to pursue. Maybe I can have you back sometime. But just in summary, would one or both of you like to just, we have a minute left, just kind of summarize what, what you've said and what mm -hmm. people should take away? I can start. Um, our, our central premise is that aging is neither good nor bad. It just is. It is how we engage it, how we respond to what arises. That's what really makes the difference. And, and really, uh, we consider our book to be optimistic because it is, it is trying to um, help people develop the kinds of skills, the kinds of habits, the kinds of choices that give them a much better chance to experience the three things that we all want as we age. We want to be relatively healthy and have our memories intact. We want to be reasonably happy. And we want to be able to live a life of meaning and purpose. And those things all weave together. We're getting the wind-up signal. Can you okay. add just a sentence at, at uh, best? I'm sorry, David. I think what I would like the audience to be able to recognize is that what we've talked about here is not Pollyanna thinking. What we've talked about here is rooted not only in modern neuroscience, but ageless wisdom. So these practices work, but they are practices and they take time to develop. Like learning to play tennis or the That's piano, right? right? Well, That's thank right. you both very much. Uh, Great to see pleasure. you again. Thank, thank you. Thank very, you. very much. Thank um, you. It's exciting to, to learn a lot from the book. Uh, I'll be back next week. Until then, have a good week and check out Staying Sharp.